Hey everybody, Andy Gideon here in a pretty special location this morning. Um, I'm in the workshop slash museum of Dennis Crooks and we're going to kind of take a quick look at some of his aircraft that have been retired and that's kind of what makes this collection uh, pretty special as most most competitors once they compete with an airplane and they get successful they're either sold off or they try to squeeze one more year out of them and lose an airplane or Dennis kind of had an instinctive uh, idea when it was time to put them up and build something else and he's kept them through all these years uh, I was a very very young child when most of these airplanes were competing but I've watched them throughout my whole life in videos reading the magazine articles and being able to see him up close and personal is really pretty cool and I'm here with Dennis now and he's going to tell us a few things about uh, some of the earlier planes in his scale career and uh, we'll let Dennis take it away starting off with the Grumman TBM uh, yeah, the, uh, the TBM was kind of a, uh, a wild hair thing uh, had a lot to do with my dad being in the Navy. Um, the, I built a couple of them. Uh, the first one um, was a, a tricolor and had, uh, I believe it had a, an OS on a belt drive, electric starter, water cooled, way too exotic. <laughs> um, big plans that uh, didn't play out. We did actually fly the airplane, but it was way too heavy, and we knew immediately that there was no way it was yeah. going to be competitive. See, that's interesting, because I, I always thought this was the first one. I, that's the impression yeah. I always had, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, the first one for the longest time was in the uh, Yorktown Museum. Uh, I haven't been there for a while, so I don't know if it's still there or not. Oh, so, so as far as you know, that, that plane still... Could still, still be around. Still exists. I'll be darned. And then uh, we literally took the airplane home that evening and uh, I started taking it apart and I started the process of building this one, and um, which was much more successful. We flew it for a number of years. Um, uh, kind of a cool airplane, very unique. As far as I know, I was the first one to fly an airplane with radio-controlled folding wings. Um, that actually moved in a, in a scale fashion, at least. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was such that you virtually had to fly the airplane off of asphalt, because just like the full scale, when the wings spread, um, they came within, you know, a, a few inches of the ground, uh -huh. and the model is the same way. So uh, we, like I say, we flew it for a number of years. Did fairly well with it. Um, initially dropped five Vortec bombs out of it. Yep. Um, but that was somewhat of a disaster. We spent way too much time looking for bombs and, and pieces <laughs> and what have you. So after that, uh, we made up a, a vacuum form torpedo. Uh, we carried a bunch of them with us. Oh, okay. We would, we would fill that torpedo with a water balloon so that it would fall proper and splash. So kind of gave it that realistic effect. Yeah, yeah. We we did what we could to, to try to do the realism thing. Um, and this and this plane was pretty much the the first success of uh, scale for you. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And was it successful from the get go, or was it a stepping stone? You know, we only had one flight on the first one, but uh, we had a pretty fair idea what to expect. And I would have to say that uh, pretty much it was pretty much bug free. We had, uh, yeah, other than self-induced problems at times. Um, We've all been there. <laughs> was pretty reliable. Yeah. Um, had a, a Super Tiger 2000 originally. And that was very marginal. Um, so he took that out and put in a 2500, and it, 
it flew beautifully after that. So, okay. Yeah, it, it did well. Yeah, it was, uh, like I said, I've watched this airplane fly numerous of times in videos, and of course, uh, all the old magazine articles that were uh, slightly before my time, unfortunately. Uh, this was uh, a really cool airplane to see, and especially in that time period, nothing like this had been done to that type of scale realism and to where it was functional to the point where it could fly. So that was really uh, not only for a first successful scale airplane, but the to have the folding wing mechanism that just made the airplane. I mean, that's that's really something special. I'd, I'd have to say that uh, for some of the old timers out there who might remember that uh, Shoney Schoenberg was the curator of the Grumman uh, Historical Department. Uh -huh. uh, and he was instrumental in getting me the, the full scale drawings for the for the hinges, the mm -hmm. wings, and the landing gear, and what have you, and um, very helpful. And of course, Bob Walker from Robart turned me loose in, in uh, the Robart machine shop and uh, allowed me to go in there and tinker and play. And, and uh, Bob taught me pretty much everything I know about machining. So <laughs> with his help, uh, we got the whole thing put together. And the, the, the wings were air operated, right? Correct. Okay. Um, I became the unofficial air cylinder tester. For the <laughs> Robart. Um, I destroyed a ton of air cylinders um, trying to get this thing to work. It, uh, pushing the wings out into place was no problem, but getting a cylinder that would withstand the the strain or the uh, the I can't think of the term, but to hold the wing back in place was the hardest part. So were they, the cylinder just held them into place, it didn't have like a lock? No. Per it, se? No, the cylinder itself was not part of the lock. Okay. But, uh, I don't know if I'm tall enough to point it out. There is a small triangle door under the wing, just like on the full size. Yep, yep. That was attached to the wing lock. Oh, okay. So that I could see if this if this door was not closed, then you the knew it wasn't locked. Correct. And how often was that an issue? Never happened. Never happened. Wow. And especially in that time period, at the 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 infancy of scale modeling and what was available, it's amazing how successful this airplane really was. Um, nowadays, even seeing planes with folding wings, you always see issues or little things going wrong, and this plane seemed to be almost virtually trouble free yeah so yeah, that's as far as the wings they, yeah. they never cost me an issue fantastic all right this one i actually remember um the learjet uh competed successfully for quite a while and during that time period duct and fans were just starting to kind of get into their groove. Engines were making good power, um, being more reliable, and uh, because of that, more sophisticated and scale airplanes were being built. And I'll let Dennis talk a little bit more about uh, what this Learjet really came from. Well, started, um, I flew uh, Mark Frankel's uh, Learjet. For a, for a number of years and liked the way it flew um, but it Mark had uh, uh, I guess what you might consider a, a sport scale wing yep. and larger nacelles to accommodate upright engines and my goal was to make a, a Learjet as accurately as I knew how um, and this is uh, my just personal modeling. This is the most accurate airplane that I built. So this this is a scale as it gets. Yeah. Even down to the the airfoil, right? Correct. It is a scale airfoil, scale thickness. Um, the turbulators on the outboard wing panel. Um, I literally measured them 
on the full scale layer, counted them. Um, it, it was built with, again, height gauges and dial calipers and what have you. The nacelles are indeed true scale. Um, full cockpit. If you were small enough to get in there, um, <laughs> everything's in it, uh, including all the seats, uh, fire extinguishers, yep. even some um, um, map cases and what have you. So anyway, um, it, it was somewhat of a project. Um, there, were, there were a lot of naysayers for this because of the wing from what I've read in articles. Correct. And there, there you were, by all means proved them 100% yeah. wrong. <laughs> uh, well, they, uh, I told them that yeah, it, it flies like a Learjet, it's not a sport airplane. Yep. Uh, uh, I never lost an engine, but I had one engine go sour once and that was enough to, uh, to convince me to keep my nose clean. Uh -huh. it, it would get unruly quickly. Um, uh, the, the hardest, probably the hardest part was changing the, the wing to the, uh, to the new airfoil. Of course, you had to build a new wing saddle. And um, so you wind up fixturing the fuselage in space, mm -hmm. uh, jig the wing up to where it needs to be, and then fill in the gap. But, um, and that, that took quite a bit of doing. Oh, I can only imagine. Uh, uh, believe it or not, it, it flew quite well. Um, fast, um, responsive, had an F-104 appearance um, in flight. Yeah, it does kind of, doesn't it? And um, I get a lot of comments about getting it down and putting turbines in it, but it's one of those things that... Uh, it, it, it served its purpose. Yeah, it, <laughs> it did well in competition. One of the disadvantages to a... a a Learjet type airplane in competition is you have virtually no aerobatic ability um, so you have to fly all of your maneuvers and so you're exposed to the judges a lot longer than yeah. say a, a Warbird or an aerobatic type airplane. So could this do uh, rolls or anything or? It, yes, the full scale Lear it wasn't certified but it could I, do it. I know. Yep. Yes. Yep. It'll do it. They can be rolled. It'd be a little difficult to convince the judges that was part of its normal routine. Gotcha. You know? So this was this was straight and level all the time Correct. for for the whole the whole time you flew it in scale. Correct. And how many years uh, did you campaign this? I I don't remember. Uh, it was probably three or four. Okay. And that had the uh, inverted mounted OS 77s. Correct. And for the, the sole purpose because the, the full scale had the, was it the, the bulge yeah, on the bottom? Kind of the belly in the, in the nacelle. Uh -huh. um, so it, it, it was just a, you know, a perfect fit for inverted engines. And um, uh, of course I ran a, a blow driver on there. Yep. Um, but minimal problems and back then uh, Wally McAllister from Mac Products made quarter wave pipes so that everything would stay inside. They were quite loud and <laughs> contributed to my hearing loss. But yeah, I think a lot of ducted fan pilots from back in the day are probably all in pretty much the same boat with hearing issues. <laughs> Unfortunately. And it's just amazing that this has been hanging up for so long and it uh, probably could still be polished into a brand new condition airplane. Uh, which is why most scale modelers use really uh, uh, basically full scale type paints. So this plane would literally shine up to brand new even though it's got a few layers of dust on it. But at least it's still here and it's still, it's still something to be looked at. Definitely one of the... Uh, premier jets of its day. Um, as Dennis said earlier with Mark Frankel's design, it was probably the first successful Learjet to be flown as far as RC models, but it was 
not extremely out of scale, but you could definitely tell it was more of a, of a sport scale design with the sport wing and the oversized nacelles. So kind of like the TBM, the Learjet was uh, kind of a, a, a milestone in its time um, being able to make it that scale. So very cool. Yeah, we were contacted by some people who wanted to use the Learjet in an advertising campaign. At, um, they were very uh, uh, discreet, I guess you'd say, about who they were and what they were doing because they didn't want us to say anything about their advertising campaign. But uh, they brought us up to, to Canada because that's where their studio was where they wanted to do this. Uh -huh. So uh, you know, we took the airplane up there and they, they hung it uh, upside down and did all kinds of, you know, that's a, that's a composite of like four different photographs. Yeah. They merged all together. I was going to say, you can see this got the, the, I don't know what you call those on the wing tips. Oh, the winglets? Yeah, the winglets, yeah. Yeah, it's got the, the Lear 31 winglets. Is uh, even then, um, I guess you could call it uh, PC. They were concerned about the wingtip tanks looking too military-ish. Yep. So they photoshopped the tanks out yep. and put in winglets. You can distinctively tell the, the clay lacy and sit the logo up here. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of cool. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of my viewers have seen uh, videos on my channel of Dennis flying his SR-71 uh, back in the, was it late 80s or was it yeah. late 80s into the early 90s? Right. And this was the prototype of the yellow aircraft. I, I don't know if I'd go quite that far because some of the folks up at Yellow in Canada were, were flying it. Uh, but it's, it still wasn't available no. as a kit yet? No. Okay. I, uh, the reason I wound up with this was uh, it was my job at the time to try to turn the SR-71 into a sport airplane. Uh, to try to <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, so that uh, anyone could fly it. And long story short, that turned out to be not possible. Yep. Um, uh, center of gravity was incredibly critical. Um, an eighth of an inch would make all the difference in the world. Oh, I bet. Um, losing a hatch or a gear door, any little thing uh, would, would disrupt the airplane. Not make it unflyable, but just make it uncomfortable. Yeah. So I, uh, I believe it's been a long time ago. I believe there is a local airport uh, west of here, a little piece. Um, I test flew it there. Matter of fact, I flew it there a number of times. Okay. And always stayed fairly high um, in the event of a an engine failure, because I, I found out early on that uh, it is flyable on one engine, but uh, you head for the runway. Yeah, you don't, you don't take your time to no. come down. You, no, got, you got one shot, pretty much. Yeah, yep. yeah don't be a hero. <clears throat> if, if it ever, uh, fortunately, I was in a situation where it never got away from it, but if it ever did, there was no getting it back. Yeah, so um, you've brought it down on one engine before? Yeah. Um, okay. As it turns out, uh, during some of my practicing, um, when the airplane was high, uh, I, I could hear one engine going south, and it finally did quit. And uh, I would literally just shut off the un other engine and, and just, head for the runway. Just go full dead stick then? Yeah. Okay. And um, I... That was a primary reason for putting uh, functional uh, rudders on the airplane. That that made it much more manageable. And those are full flying, right? Correct. Okay. Um, very effective. Oh yeah. Uh, that made single engine flight 
um, a little less treacherous. Um, it, uh, I remember uh, one particular event down in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, at a jet rally where uh, I was doing a loop, and right at the top of the loop, an engine seized. Um, the airplane literally turned 90 degrees right toward the pits. Oh, geez. Um, upside down. Um, and without the rudders, I don't think I would have ever saved it. But, uh, you, would, you would have been forced to, to put it in. For, say again? You would have been, if without the rudders, oh, and you would yeah. have been forced to put it in. Yeah. Yep. Upside down at that altitude, I. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I so that made a big difference. And um, I, it, again, it's been too long ago. I, I don't know if this one had 77s or 91s. Um, but we flew it for like four years. Uh -huh. Had a lot of fun with it. Um, could never really relax. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't look like a enjoyable airplane to fly. I, yeah, you have you, to be in the mood. <laughs> it was fun when you taxi back. That was, yeah, <laughs> that was the fun yep. part. Um, but I, I had uh, a couple of ducted fans explode. Um, uh, break off fins, and uh -huh. when one fin broke, the rest of them would stack up behind it, and it horribly imbalanced at 20,000 RPM. Oh and man! It would literally break every bulkhead in the airplane. <laughs> um, and when you landed, you could tell that the the wing tips would droop. You, you couldn't pick it up because everything the outside of the airplane looked fine. But internally, it was mush. Oh man! Um, that happened twice, and uh, after that, I, I put it away. Yep. Once yeah. again, it it served its purpose. Yeah, yeah. It, Which, kind of in a way, wasn't very beneficial. <laughs> but it was extremely exciting for for those that got to see it fly. Um, I got videos of. Uh, Byron made a very large SR-71, which was marginally successful. It, it seemed to have a lot of bad tendencies on landing to pitch almost straight vertical in the air and yes. fall on its hind end. Yeah. <laughs> um, the airplane would give you warning in that it would start a, a little bit of a Dutch roll. Yep. And if you persisted, um, the next thing would happen was the nose would start coming up. And at that point, uh, there's nothing you can do. Uh, you just have to ride it out. Oh, man. And more than once, I've had the airplane literally back into the ground, land on its tail. Yep. And then so, this, so this one has done that same maneuver. Oh, yes. Oh, man. Um, and it, it, didn't, it won't fall over backwards. It always fell forward. And in a lot of cases... I could taxi it back. <laughs> you know, it, the airplane would be fine, but it, it was not the preferred way to land. So a, a successful high alpha landing with an SR-71. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I have done it. And it's just one of those things. It, it would have been nice to have had telemetry in those days so I could tell how fast I was going on, on final. Right. Very cool. And besides his scale modeling career, he was also uh, big into the air racing back in the air racing heyday, which is uh, unfortunately not what it used to be. It's kind of trickled away, at least the, the size airplanes of this one. Uh, Dennis has a pair of these P-38s, which are based off of the Nick Zeroli design, which he had made a full com uh, full composite version. Uh, this one here he flew in scale, uh, once again, quite successfully. And the other one was built specifically for racing. And I've only seen videos of this flying uh, as far as in a race, and unbelievable. Um, it still baffles me that it stayed together because of the the, the amount of G's uh, that this airplane took in its in its uh, typical flight was just unbelievable. Uh, did you have to do anything 
special beside differing from the scale version for this one to make it into a racer? Well, um, I guess they they were both built um, or laid out virtually identical. Um, therefore, the, the scale version is horribly overbuilt. <laughs> but uh, there is, a, uh, of course, a fair amount of carbon fiber um, in the race plane, yep. um, not only in the booms, but in the horizontal stabilizer. Um, the, the weak point on a, on a P-38 mostly is right behind the main gear doors on the boom. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, there's, <laughs> there's just not a whole lot of structure there. So in this case, yep. there is uh, added carbon fiber. Um, and uh, Nomax honeycomb for the landing gear doors so that they would not distort. Um, probably the, the biggest uh, strength issue, of course, was the main wing spar. And I give a lot of credit again to Bob Walker for that, as the, uh, the spar is laminated plywood, carbon fiber, um, plywood, carbon fiber and then uh, aluminum blade spars going out into the wing. Wow. Um, and I don't know if it's by luck or by skill, but when, when you were on the race course, the entire wing would flex uh, oh, yeah. into, a, into a U shape as opposed to there being a stress riser where uh, you know maybe the outer panel would flex the whole thing flexed yep. and um, went a long way toward keeping the airplane in one piece. <laughs> How many G's do you think you were pulling? Oh, I, I don't have a, a, a lot. <laughs> I don't have a clue. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, scale terms, it would be fatal for the pilot and airframe. I <laughs> don't doubt that. At least, is it, um, at least straight and level, it was a little over 200 miles an hour. Oh, and so man. so you're going into a turn... <clears throat> Um, uh, nearly 180 degree turn within a couple of seconds and uh, so like most racers would go to knife edge and then just yank the elevator uh, I couldn't do that um, you had to fly it through the turn correct yeah uh, uh, by about halfway into the turn I'd have full up elevator but I, I couldn't just bang the stick I, yeah I had to nurse it around so it, it would it would it probably definitely would have folded up if you would have done a yank and bang turn. Correct. Yep. Uh, Which happens a lot in racing anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we won a few races, but uh, mostly, well, our, our sponsors in, in the day uh, liked it because uh, we, were, we were memorable, I guess you would say. Oh, yeah. You... Uh, you see, you go to the races back then, even still to this day, you see, uh, you know, stilettos, you modified Bearcats. You didn't see P-38s. No. Um, and if you did, you wouldn't expect to see it do what this airplane was doing, uh, turning the course and other uh, uh, top placing pilots were quite intimidated by this airplane, where I'm sure their initial thought was, Oh, I can beat a P-38. Yeah. He's gonna have to nurse that thing around, nurse that thing around the course like a baby, and a few times you proved him wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, of course, the, the P-38 has somewhat of a, I think, undeserved reputation as being a treacherous airplane. Um, I literally raced the airplane on one engine um, at least one time that I remember. There were probably others. Um, so you, at the end of the race, if one engine would quit, you um, kept going. Just keep going. And was it still being competitive with one engine? Um, it, depending on where I was, no, it was not competitive. But if I were f far enough in front of, say, the the second or third place flyer, uh -huh. um, I could hopefully maintain my position. Yeah. And, um, the last thing you wanted was a DNF. So right, it was it was better to not place well than than to be 
well disqualified. Correct. Yeah. So they they would let me race on one, but you found out right away that you had to really be careful <laughs> when the turns. You know, oh, if you, I'm sure if you just breathed on the elevator too wrong, it probably would have snapped. Yeah, yeah, yep. it'd get unruly real quick. But uh, you get out of the elevator, gather it up, and go again. Yep. Um, and I, unbeknownst to me, um, well, I, I I brought out one of the engines and laid it on the on the workbench. Um, that's a 6.6 Husqvarna. Um, and this is custom built. This was built for that airplane. Correct. Okay. Um, I took off on one engine. Um, at some point during the takeoff roll, one or climb out, one engine quit. And there was so much power, I didn't notice until downwind and the airplane <laughs> didn't feel right. Uh, something's wrong. Uh, oh, I got a dead engine, so I came in and landed. You know, I, I wasn't foolish enough to start a race on one. But, right. Um, yeah, there was so much power. Uh, but just by having the one dead engine, uh, were these counter rotating props or yes. no? Okay, so that. So if you didn't have counter rotating props and you lost the wrong engine, you probably I would not have been able to get it airborne. Yeah, I don't know it a lot sooner. <laughs> it's just amazing that you were able with that, especially with that much power, able to successfully even take it off. Um, the the P thirty eight that I've flown, I don't think I could have got them off the ground with one engine. No. I, I, I think they would have gotten just past a high speed taxi before they ended up on one side of the field or the other. And we were turning. Uh, carbon fiber, um, what, 20, well, they were originally 22, 22 props, cut down to 19, 22. Wow. Um, <laughs> all right. It had more than enough power if you could hang on to the rudder. Yep. And the, uh, the scale version, it literally came out of the same mold. Um, same construction, same everything. Um, so it, it's obviously quite strong, um, but it, I I felt like it was somewhat of a tribute that I could I could not only race that airplane, but I could doll it up, turn it into a, a competitive scale airplane, and do quite well. With and this it. and this was successful. Yes. Um, was this a Top Gun airplane, or was this only a Scale Masters? Uh, it never won Top Gun officially. Um, that's a case where I have a, a couple of second place trophies I'm pretty proud of. <laughs> but um, uh, it did well. Uh, we uh, Something that I was kind of proud of, we, we won the Scale Masters three years in a row. With this airplane? Correct. Wow. And that was like, um, like California and Arizona and I don't know, may have been, I don't remember where the third one was, but in any event, they weren't in the same location, so mm -hmm. <laughs> you were flying against different people. And, and in yeah. different different conditions and everything. Right. So it, um, I, that's an airplane that I really kind of hated to retire. Um, <laughs> it was so much fun to fly. We, we sport flew it a lot. Well, I'm sure probably it probably contributed to the, the competitiveness. Cause you oh, could yeah. Sit, it was just like an old shoe. You, know, you just take it out and fly it. Well, it's a nice day out. <laughs> uh, the primary reason I hung it up was uh, the servos were starting to go south, and I... Yeah. I I, I started replacing servos and I thought, you know, I've flown it hard for 10 years. It's earned its keep. 10 years? Yeah. Wow. So, there it is. I wish I could have a plane two years that still maintained uh, its original prettiness, but unfortunately for me that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> mm. And uh, before we wrap it up, I do have to ask about that spinner and prop blade up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's... That just kind of catches the eye. Yeah, the the P thirty eight story. That that um, uh, early on, I was flying, and I, it, it, that's the same airplane. I was flying it on uh, like custom made wooden three bladed propellers uh -huh. that a, a friend of mine put together. Um, 
and uh, we were flying at the at the one eighth Air Force in Arizona. Uh, you know, just a fun fly, um, coming around to make a, a high speed pass, and just as I had leveled out on what would be considered long final, mm -hmm. I throttled up, and I noticed the right spinner just blinked and it was gone. Uh, you know, just to myself, I like, great, you know, <laughs> spinner came off. Um, and soon after that, the airplane started a gradual turn to the left. Uh, well, that's odd. I just straightened it out and kept coming. Um, but the, the longer it went, the worse it flew. Yep. Um, at that point, I, I still didn't know what had happened. So uh, I made a, a climbing right turn, which of course was into the dead engine that everybody says you're not supposed to do. But in any event, I had a fair amount of speed. Yep. Uh, Sometimes you have no choice. <laughs> a climbing right turn, and apparently I relaxed enough rudder when I reached for the gear switch that the airplane tried to roll inverted. And uh, I, I caught it and made kind of a modified split S, came around and landed. And uh, after we touched down, uh, an airplane landed, set back on its tail. That's when <laughs> I realized not only had I lost the spinner, I'd lost the entire engine. Oh, man. And um, so the, the airplane was fine. Um, it just knocked the lower cowl off. Um, and that was this one that's hanging up here. Yeah. That's okay. That airplane. So I, I kept what's left of my spinner. And, <laughs> made, a, made a plaque out of it. I think every time, uh, and this it probably goes for modelers across the board. I know I have a few of these little uh, little keepsakes in my shop for interesting accidents that happened over the years that you just can't help but look at and <laughs> and laugh and tell the story. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's that, pretty cool. Uh, I, I just I I feel bad when people kind of bad mouth the P-38, so I've, I've had so much fun with it that um, I, I'd like to try to dispel that rumor a little bit, uh, Yeah. especially the Zeroli P-38. Oh, yeah. Um, I've flown that airplane on one more times than I can count. Um, it, it almost seems like a Zeroli P-38 counter-rotating props and a good pilot, you, you can't go wrong. Yeah. And uh, for the viewers that saw a video I posted a while back, uh, Jerry Kessler's P-38 uh, is one of the best flying uh, scale airplanes I've ever flown in my life and it was not hard to fly by any means uh, obviously if it lost an engine it might give a little trouble but as long as if you're flying a plane of that <laughs> that type you need to have the flying skills behind you um, but yeah it's definitely the a lot of the horror stories have gotten out of hand throughout the years but uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, Dennis, I want to thank you for uh, the private tour of the museum. It's definitely, <laughs> it's really cool for me to see. Um, I've, obviously, there's a lot of the other airplanes around the shop that are still flying. We're not going to go into detail on those because they're, they're still flyable aircraft, so they're still going to be seen. Um, but it was really cool talking to you about the history of uh, kind of the beginning of your modeling career and almost a, a new beginning in scale altogether because that, uh, that was a very interesting time in scale. A lot of new things that nobody thought you could do and things are being done and it was pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I appreciate it, Andy. Yep. Um, this is, uh, I just didn't want to wake up one morning and 90 years old and have nothing to show for my life's work so <laughs> Lynn and I decided that at some point uh, an airplane's worth more than a trophy so we just hang yep. them up and here they are. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be cool if more people would do the same so thanks again Dennis. Sure thing, thank you.